Welcome to the Career Meets World podcast, Ashwin. It is so, so good to have you with us today. How is the first part of the year treating you thus far? The first part of the year is, um, firstly, thank you for having me on the show. Always, always fun to do this outside of my day-to-day job. Um, the first part of the year has been amazing. We had our biggest uh, quarter in Gainsight history. So from a business standpoint, things are going great. We are working with Vista now um, and uh, the relationship is off to a great start. And personally, we had our um, second baby born in November, technically last year, but I'm enjoying um, going through uh, a new baby at home. Um, so lots of lots of fun things happening personally and professionally. Lots of good change in your life. You're always an optimist and you're always somebody who's full of energy. And that's why I love talking with you. So congratulations on having your second child. I'm super excited for your family. Congratulations on all the success with Gainsight. For those who might not know, Gainsight is arguably the most powerful customer success tool on the planet. I've been fortunate to be a user when I was working back in the corporate world at multiple companies. So you're running a team of about 150 people. Is that right? Yes, it's up to 200 now. So, but um, yeah, it's been, it's been awesome. So it's growing, right? And Part of what we love discussing here on the podcast is really the mental fortitude it takes to get to a level of being able to confidently manage 200 people, which again, some people envision doing or some people want to do that. But I'm curious to really learn, is this something you ever had at the forefront of your mind that one day I'm going to be in C-suite, running such a large team, driving such massive impact. I'm just curious what your initial vision was for your career and was this really it? Yes, Um, I wish I could tell you that I wanted to be a CCO when I was five years old, definitely (laughs) wasn't the case. Um, But I've I've, um, through, and the path to getting here hasn't been a straight one. It's gone through multiple different iterations for me to um, introspect what I want to do and what I enjoy doing in my day-to-day life. And um, l- luck has a huge role to play to find the right thing at the right time as well. And I've landed in the role that I cherish um, right now. So I'll maybe like um, briefly craft the path that it's taken to get there and then, yeah, open to more questions and conversation, uh, Edward. Um, so I, uh, r- straight out of college, I was I like any... Um, good uh, Indian would do. I got, I graduated in engineering and quick and joined like an IT company where I started coding and became an engineer. Quickly realized within the first quarter or two quarters that I sucked as an engineer. Um, I shouldn't have done engineering in the four years. Plus, I shouldn't be in the job that I was in. Uh, what I learned was the biggest um, thing that I enjoyed even in that role was Um, getting the team together to solve a common problem, getting one person to talk to the other when their metrics weren't aligned, when they had their own jobs, Um, talking to clients, all of those things gave me a lot of joy. Sitting behind a desk didn't give me lots of joy. And so that was maybe spark number one that said, I'm not doing what I like doing. And so then I said, I should probably think about like a marketing or a sales career because those are more frontline facing, talking to people, um, convincing people of my ideas, et cetera. So got my MBA right after that, um, quit my engineering uh, job and got my MBA and then started um, in several go-to-market roles. I didn't know what I want. I still probably don't know what I want. And so started in some business development, uh, raised my hand for a product marketing job when that opened up, tried that one. Um, then quickly there was a role um, serving the Japanese market, learned the language, went, lived in Japan for a little bit, uh, learned a ton about a brand new culture and maybe working in uh, a new country and convincing people to do things that I wanted them to do and learned what works, what didn't work. Um, and slowly, uh, again, like it's almost like a pinball machine, went from one thing to the other, learned something here, learned something there. Again, the common thread being I loved um, I loved influencing outcomes. I loved problem solving. I loved the notion of Uh, solving multiple problems at the same time and going through the mental model to prioritize things, um, solve one, 
use the collective intelligence of a group to solve tough problems. Like those were the things that were giving me joy. Um, and so as I took a step back, said, um, what do I want to do next? Um, the next natural thing for me was um, maybe some job that has um, something new to offer every few months. And that like consulting definitely scratched that itch. And so right after my job in semiconductors, I went and um, started at McKinsey and Company, the consulting firm for uh, almost four years, uh, where I would do a new engagement in go-to-market in marketing, sales, customer experience. I would do a new project every three months. So there, it was always a brand new problem. It was convincing experts in the field how to think about the problem in a very different light, um, which was all amazing challenges. Enjoyed my time at the firm, um, got tired of the travel four days a week. Um, so the net net at the end of McKinsey, I learned, I still love being with people. I still love solving hairy challenges and delivering outcomes. Um, I don't like traveling four days a week. And so I said, okay, what next? And so Gainsight happened at that same time. And again, like pinball machine, move from one thing to the other and ended up in the role that I'm in and love, love the role because um, I and my team have a dual charter. We obviously have to make our clients super successful, our customers super successful, but then we also have the higher order responsibility and the power in a way to uh, almost define what the community should do or could do next in customer success 2.0, in customer success 3.0, and n.0s beyond that, right? So it's a very fun role. Um, love doing all the things internally and love doing all the things externally as well. So long response to your question, Edward, but that's how that's how I came to be. I appreciate you sharing that answer because, again, highlighting somebody's journey and somebody's career is the most interesting thing you can learn about them professionally, right? Personally, right. there's a lot more underneath to Ashwin that we obviously will get into in a second. But what I love about your career is truthfully, I don't think I ever even shared with you, we have a weirdly similar career where I too started in engineering. I too kind of went down that route initially realizing I don't necessarily want to be doing micro level work. That's I think right. you and I both love the macro level zoom out complex problems all over the place. And how do we stitch it together? That's the fun part. The thing is a lot of people go down the engineering route like ourselves, right? And they, whether it be from, uh, again, it's very common for immigrants to go down this route, right? Right. We get to be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer. Those are three of the most common right. things we get to do. So you and I both chose engineering. But if you were to give yourself advice or maybe somebody who is of the age of deciding what they want to study, what would be your recommendation given everything you've learned, given everything you've seen in the business world now, coupled with where the world is trending, what would be your main recommendation about how to go about the thought process to make a decision and what to study? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. Uh, I don't know if I have a silver bullet response for you, Edward, but um, I'll, I'll take the lens of someone growing up in India or anywhere outside the US where career counseling and things are not part of what a school offers, which like a lot of kids in the US have that luxury and that privilege, which is amazing. I, I envy what my daughter and my son are gonna go through because um, they get those types of resources in schools, but at least in India, that's not a thing. Um, and so uh, answering your question for someone potentially who doesn't have um, that level of resources, if you have that level of resources, spend the time, work with those people and um, ask, force them to ask you the tough questions of who, what makes you, what types of things give you joy. It's not the profession. What types of day-to-day -day activities give you joy and let them coach you on maybe certain types of professions are the right fits for the types of skills that you have and the things that you enjoy. If you don't have access to those types of resources, um, maybe one thing that you could do is go outside of your family and ask for introductions to people in like two or three different professions that you think are could be interesting for you. Uh, ask them the question of like what a day in their life looks like. 
because it's very hard to know what I actually don't know what a lawyer does day in and day out. Like, yes, I know I see part of what they do in movies, but you know, there has to be a boring part to their lives, right? Like there has to be a fun part to their lives. So what gives joy? What is, what are things in their day-to-day lives that are super boring and they don't enjoy? And then equate it back to things that spark joy in you and that don't spark joy in you. Like basically Mary Kondo, your uh, inner being and see like whether a new job is going to give you that kind of joy or not. And like, so reach out of your comfort zone, out of your family. If you don't have uh, people in those roles in your family, reach out to your friends. Um, don't be shy about asking and talking to a ton of people before you start thinking about what career choices you want to make and what you want to learn. So as valuable as I know your advice is, which is go seek out help, especially if you are an immigrant or you are somebody who never had that support, whether it be with family or counseling, what I find often is that a lot of people in this position are actually reluctant to ask for that help, right? right? Because they feel like they have to figure it out on their own. When did you figure out for yourself that it's better to ask for help than to go down the rabbit hole of, I'm going to figure this out, especially as an engineer, we often like to re or kind of basically construct everything as it is. So for, for you, what was that process like to really understand, okay, if I really want to excel, I need to go and talk to people who have been in that role, been in that position, been in that situation. What was the mindset shift for you like? Yeah, for me, that happened very late. Uh, it happened after um, after I quit my job at the IT company. Um, before I started my MBA program, I basically spent about six months acting as um, working as a technical editor for a um, for a uh, technical book book publisher, basically, um, uh, like a Pearson or a Wiley, basically, um, and they were called Rocks. I lucked into the situation where, again, like I found a mentor there who helped me think through this. I I didn't ever personally um, code in XML, whereas I edited a book in XML. And so uh, I would have never, if you had asked me, I would have never thought that it was humanly possible for me to do something like that. And so it required someone else, um, someone uh, who I thought of as a mentor pushing me and saying, actually, you don't need to be the expert. Like, have you gone and spoken to these three people within the company and picked their brains on this before you start reading 10 books on this topic? And I said, wow, like that is so simple. Why didn't I think of it? And it required someone outside of my comfort zone to push me or to push me out of my comfort zone and do things um, that I would have not done naturally. But once I did it for the first time, I saw the power of the collective intelligence being so much greater than me trying to do this on my own. Um, it's so much more efficient. It's so much more ef- effective. Um, since then, like I've, I've never tried to boil the ocean on my own. Um, even now, like part of my job, I see it as even if another CS leader doesn't ask me to introduce him or her to appear in the community, I will volunteer and make sure that they get introduced to a buddy outside of their business because they may not know it, but there is so much else that the community can give you. And so um, I'm trying to do a little bit to pay that forward, but that's how I lucked upon it. I wish I can tell you that I was, um, I thought of it on my own, wasn't true, but um, I'm definitely going to tell my son and daughter to do those things, which um, I've learned along my way. I love that. What I always love sharing with people is that our minds are expansive and there's always opportunity to learn and grow and absorb more information. So anytime somebody's pushing you at any age, even your CEO today, your partner, your kids might even push you in different ways, be open to those opportunities. And I think that goes very well into somebody's early stage in their career. Right. So again, I think you've done this incredible kind of mishmash of different types of roles, which has afforded you this incredible opportunity to run the customer success team at Gainsight. What I want to ask you is today, there's a lot of new roles 
that kind of pop up and customer success realistically it existed in different ways right right it's this new branded term that's been around for 10 plus years at this point right but how does somebody actually land a customer success job, right? Somebody might be starting out in their career and they see a customer success job on a job board and they might be interested because obviously the title sounds great. Who wouldn't want their customers to actually succeed? Or there's people like myself who basically went from a project management role into a customer success role. So there's different types of pivots, but what's your recommendation when you're looking at candidates? What are yep. you actually seeking in terms of qualities that they exude that would tell you, hey, this person's actually going to be really good at this type of a role? Yes, very good question. Um, I think there are like in in the book that Ruben and I had the opportunity to write, like we talk about the three skills that make up a great customer success manager, or at least a good customer success manager. Uh, one is um, what we call as the capability quotient, which is this notion of um, knowing your product, obviously it can't happen before you started a company, but knowing your domain or your product that you are making your customer successful on incredibly well and knowing your customer's context, business context really well. Then the second thing is EQ, which is obviously like, how do you empathize with someone? How do you put yourself in their shoes? How do you uh, better prepare for meetings so that you're being um, respectful of others' times, et cetera, right? Like that is all EQ. And then the third thing, which is problem solving or IQ, which is all about customer success jobs are you've got 20, 30, 40 customers to manage. Each one is completely different. Each one has their own version of problems or challenges that you're trying to solve for them. And how do you think about like pivoting between all of this? How do you bring different people within your company to solve that problem? Uh, it's basically this notion of grit, if you will. Um, you're not hunkered down by any one problem. You're able to bounce back from a bad day and celebrate the good days and you still keep moving forward. That notion is what is the um, IQ part or the grit part. So the long-winded response to your question is it's really hard to develop CQ if you are very new to your career, you don't have the domain expertise or the product expertise. So I wouldn't focus there, but to your point, project management is a great background for a lot of CSMs because you are solving for the problem solving part of that equation and maybe to some extent the EQ part of that equation by because for, for, to be a good project manager, you have to prioritize ruthlessly. You have to keep multiple people moving in the same direction, which are all really good skill sets for a CSM from the IQ mindset. And so pick professions or pick things that you can do or, um, or, or pick up on skills that basically solve the three sides to the triangle that I described. And that will put you on a great path for a career in customer success. It's a really thorough explanation. What is the name of your book and where can people grab it? Uh, it's on Amazon um, and it's called uh, Customer Success Professionals Handbook. Um, and you can look that up. And um, yeah, I mean, I've got amazing uh, feedback on things that worked really well, especially for early to career folks in CS in the CS world, um, as well as even CS managers thinking about how to think about career leveling and job mapping for their CSMs as their teams grow, uh, even within their teams. But it's all on Amazon and there's an audiobook version as well, if it's interesting. Awesome. We'll definitely include those in the show notes to make sure that people can grab a copy if they're interested. Sounds great. With that being said, one of the things that I'm biased about is that I, I too ran a customer success team at multiple companies. And one of the things that I'll say, and I learned actually from your boss, Nick Mehta, who's the CEO of Gainsight, is that customer success transcends every single organization. So for me, the one recommendation I would have for somebody is if you're unsure of what exactly you want to do post-college or early on your career. I actually think customer success gives you a vantage point into all different types of roles within the company because you have to stitch everything together from sales to marketing to product. 
even have conversations with the backend engineering team and really make sure that you can deliver the best possible solution for the customer. So again, kind of selfish plug for a lot of people who are interested in customer success. And I know that you're super passionate about helping people elevate their game and you have these, this ability to really expand what CSMs and that world are going to look like over the next 10 years or so. Where do you think it's trending, right? Where do you think this world of really impacting customers is heading? Um, it's heading, um, like I wish I can tell you with precision where it's headed, but I'll, I'll uh, maybe hypothesize a couple of things. The first one is um, it's almost like the two ends of the spectrum. There is the human end of the spectrum and the completely automated end of the spectrum. Um, on the completely automated or scaled end of the spectrum, increasingly B2C experiences, so what you experience with like a Netflix or an Amazon or things that you would do on a day-to-day -day basis are shaping your experiences on the B2B side. Your uh, patience for what a business to business product that you use in your day to day world, be it Gainsight, Slack, Zoom, whatever else you might use, your, your expectation is it works as easily and seamlessly as your iPhone does or as your Netflix account works, right? Like you have no patience for multiple clicks. You don't have patience for things to load and all of those things. And so your product is becoming your number one CSM over time. Like that is on the scale side, you're doing more in-app communications. Everything is very contextual. Everything is the product is learning from which parts of the product are being clicked upon a lot more than others, right? Like it's almost like a, a, a machine that feeds on itself and gets better and better and more customized to any particular user or user group. And so um, that is one thing. So products will become exactly what your B2C experiences are shaped by. And then on the human side, um, I think one, one thing that Nick and I have been advocating for and talking a lot about is today, if you think about like the pay gap between what a salesperson makes and a CSM makes, it's significantly different. And CSMs are way lower on that spectrum than what our sales peers are at. As more companies' revenue comes from install base, as the uh, impact of delivering outcomes and value um, ex like contributes to revenue way more than what a new logo revenue can bring into the company, over time, that parity will become lesser and potentially become equal or even different. Doesn't mean sales isn't important, but maybe the sales people that we need in the future are very different from what they look like today. And so that is another, um, like almost like the compensation aligning with the value provided to the organization is, um, is a measure I think that'll change over time. It's such a good perspective because one of the things to know about customer success roles, right? There's some organization where you have high or low volume amount of customers and the engagement, the interaction, the support is really varied right between low and high touch but right. what you just said is near and dear to my heart because obviously sales roles get paid significantly more because of perception and value and it is hard to land clients but keeping customers happy keeping them engaged keeping them renewing is equally as hard and requires a very different type of muscle so i love hearing the fact that you're focused on this and helping hopefully evolve the industry as well as the maturation process continues. So look, with that being said, one of the things that I always like to ask folks really at the end is you have done so much throughout your career, you've evolved in different ways. And I'm just curious, how do you personally love to give back to the community? Because I know you're a community guy. Gainsight is very much about supporting one another. So what are some of the things that you love to do in giving back outside of pure work? Um, yeah, excellent question. Like a few things, um, a few things related to customer success and maybe a few things outside of customer success. A few things related to customer success. These are very small things potentially in the bigger scheme of things, but um, I get asked by a lot of people on LinkedIn, both early to career, um, early in their career, CS, 
professionals or prospective CS professionals, all the way to executives at companies today that want to either move roles or are thinking about like what next in their career in CS. I make it a point to say yes to almost all of those conversations, whatever I can pack into my calendar. I do close to um, like four to five such meetings, like mentoring meetings and career conversations with folks every week. And so um, that is a small little thing. I have the, again, privilege of seeing multiple companies hiring. I have the privilege of seeing um, multiple people looking for jobs. And so um, it, the small something that I can do with um, what I can, the, the um, commodity that I have that I can control is time. And so one of the ways that I'm thinking about it is if I can give back this time to people who are looking for roles in CS, that I think will further us as a community. So that is one piece. Then the second is outside of Gainsight and CS, the community. And obviously the book was meant also as a way to give back to the community. And I don't get paid on royalties or anything related to the book. Um, it's all about like, can we get better at doing our jobs as CSMs and as CS professionals, right? So that was the impetus behind writing the book. And then the outside of uh, Gainsight, I'm on the board of uh, a not-for-profit uh, uh, company called Not In Our Town, which mm. um, does a lot of work in anti-bullying and in schools and then anti-hate crimes in um, as of now um, like American cities um, but the general idea is we live in a world where the world is very divided and the U.S. is very divided and uh, whatever we can do to bridge the gap and make sure that it doesn't translate to hate crimes and bullying in schools um, it's a small part of giving back to um, the EQ part of the world that we live in and make make maybe the world a better place. That's awesome. Uh, that's near and dear to my heart again, because at the end of the day, as you know, the main thing that I want to do is empower people and support kind of minority communities, especially immigrant communities. And what you're doing is really relevant because the world is divisive and it is fractionalized now. So the more we can do to bridge that back together, especially with somebody like yourself, who's passionate, who's positive and really wants to inspire people. I thank you for doing that on behalf of so many people. Ashvin, look, before we let every single guest off the hook, we always put them through our hot seat and ask you some rapid fire questions. So are you ready? I am super ready. Let's do this. I always love asking this question of everyone because one thing I believe is that everyone is both a student and a teacher. Yep. So if you had to teach one thing for the rest of time, what would it be? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, um, it's a great question. I would teach. Um, I would teach feedback um, in companies, like how to give feedback to your teams and receive feedback. Um, I've done that for years now, and I think um, do that pretty well. And coaching on that may be something that I would do. I'm just guessing that there's a heavy dose of EQ that has to go into that. Exactly. Good guess. <laughs> exactly. So look, the other thing I love to ask people is if you had an opportunity right now to show up in Times Square in New York and put whatever you want all over the billboards as one message, one saying that people could read, what would you write? Ooh, um, I'd say it's a toss up between the two parts of my world. Um, so I don't know which, I, which one I'll choose. So I'll cheat on your question and say two things. Uh, one is like customer success is the future is one thing that I would advocate. And then the other one would be um, the, the not in our town, uh, make a plug for them uh, or like anti-bullying or an anti-hate crime type message. Um, yeah. So I cheat. Times Square is massive. There's plenty of space for both. That's messages. right. That's right. Uh, I know the other thing that many people do, even though I know you credited having good mentors in your life, consumption through content, through reading is really, really powerful. Right. What are two or three of your favorite books? 
Ooh, um, one that I really like for um, especially leaders and aspiring leaders is Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Mm. Um, highly recommend reading that book. Um, uh, it's it's written in the form of a fiction, but has business concepts in it, which I thought was one such an easy way to digest it and like really good concepts. So that is one that I would highly recommend. Um, and then the other one that I'm currently lead, uh, reading, which um, which I'm loving, is this book called Humankind, um, which uh, argues the the idea that actually human beings, our natural state is actually to get along well with each other. It is not actually to cause wars. It is not, uh, it's not actually to fight with each other. And so there's, he creates, proves several arguments and several points in favor of um, how we are actually wired internally. Uh, and it's actually a, a really good thing. Like we're, we're um, meant to live in peace. I love that. Uh, definitely two books that I'm going to add to my list and share it out with everyone else. Thank you for joining us on the hot seat. Ashvin, it was such a pleasure connecting with you today and hearing about your story, your journey, your advice, your thoughts on customer success. If people do want to reach out to you and connect, what is the easiest way for them to do so? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. That is the easiest way to reach out to me. Um, and you can look for me at Ashwin Vedinathan. Um, I don't think there are too many more um, with that name and look for Gainsight. There should be only one. Awesome. I love people who have a very specific name, including myself, even though it might sound generic, where there are no other humans on that planet with that name. That's right. Thank you, Ashvin, for joining us today. And as we always say on the Career Meets World podcast, go unleash your wildest potential. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me, Edward.